Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the show. In our previous episode with Adi Rotem, we talked a lot about martial arts and the fighter's spirit. A number of you guys reached out and expressed some desire to hear some more concrete self-defense tips. First of all, thank you guys for reaching out. And second of all, I think you're going to love today's episode. My guest is Ms. Jennifer Cassetta, a clinical nutritionist, personal trainer, and third-degree black belt with a passion to empower women to be strong, safe, and sexy. But gentlemen, don't tune out just yet. Jennifer has created the popular Stilettos and Self-Defense DVD series. She's recently published a book, and she's been featured on tons of different media outlets from the Today Show to E! She teaches empowerment, safety, and self-defense workshops around the country, and is a nutrition and corporate wellness specialist in Los Angeles. As you'll quickly notice, Jennifer and I really had a lot of fun chatting, and we go on a lot of interesting but kind of unrelated tangents. Whether you're a male or a female, this episode will offer you a lot of value and maybe remind you of some important mindset adjustments you should be keeping at the forefront of your mind. We talk about all kinds of different ways to defend your heart, your mind, and your body from would-be attackers, ranging from being conscious of what types of things and people you expose yourself to, all the way to grass-fed beef. Furthermore, for the men in the audience, Jennifer's wisdom will definitely offer you some great insights and ideas that you can share with the women in your life to help them stay happy, healthy, and safe. And I know we all want that. I think you'll have a lot of fun listening to the episode, and I hope you take a lot away from it as well. Jennifer, welcome to the show today. We're so happy to have you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Actually, one of our uh, audience members recommended that we reach out to you, so I'm super excited to uh, hear what you have to say today. Yeah. Well, that's very cool to whoever you are. Thank you. (laughs) Indeed. I think it was Jeff from Texas. I think his wife is a fan of yours. That's amazing. Awesome, right? Yeah. So Jennifer, tell us a bit about yourself for those who don't know. What do you do and how did you get into what you're doing today? Ooh, that's a loaded question, Jonathan. I'll start with, I guess, how I got into the health and wellness career path. And that kind of started back in 2000 with my first Hup Keto class. I wanted to just try martial arts as a form of getting fit I was just a couple years out of college and my dad had started martial arts maybe a decade before then. And he was always like, Jenny, you know, you'd be really good at this. You should try this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Mm, no, thanks. But then somehow it appealed to me. I was on a subway like, hey, what if this guy like grabbed me? What would I do? Blah, blah, blah. So one thing led to another. I immediately became obsessed with it. I was going to a school called World Martial Arts Center in Manhattan and just the teacher and the other black belt instructors, like it was such a empowering place to be that I wound up wanting to spend all my free time there. Wow. Yeah. So about a year later, 9-11 happened and I was working down by the World Trade Center. Needless to say, that morning I was covered in dust and where I worked, didn't crumble, but I lost my job. We couldn't get back in there. So that was sort of the impetus to get me thinking like, what do I really want to do with my life? What if life really is short? You never know, you know, when your last day is. So why not really choose a career that makes you happy and is serving other people? So I really, before that, I was managing a nightclub and then marketing for this event space. So I didn't feel like I was really contributing to society. So I wanted people to experience the same benefits that I was getting from martial arts, which was the physical strength, the mental and emotional strength, and even a new spiritual growth as well. Yeah. I actually also did martial arts for a period. And that's really more than anything. When I was really, really young, I did. And more than anything, that's what I took away. I mean, the self-defense skills were really amazing, but it's more about knowing how to carry yourself and uh, Mm -hmm. having confidence in your ability to defend yourself and Mm -hmm. 
kind of taking out some of that rambunctiousness as well. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing I think a lot of people that aren't familiar with martial arts don't know about are those benefits too, because it's really incredible. So that kind of started the journey. I and mean, I said, how can I make this a full-time career? So I became certified personal trainer, started getting clients in Manhattan, private clients, and did that, taught at the, the martial arts school, then went back to nutrition. So I did two courses over a six-year period. Basically, I did the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is like a holistic study program, and then went back to school for my master's degree in nutrition. And that pretty much was a 12-year journey of all of that together. Amazing. Your story kind of reminds me of uh, James Altucher's kind of choose yourself motto that he likes so much because it really, you can see throughout your story that you really, at one point you decided, you know what, I'm going to choose myself. I'm going to invest in myself. Mm -hmm. I think if this were an entrepreneurial podcast, I would love to dig more into that process of tenacity. (laughs) Definitely. I have stories. It wasn't easy. I spent more money than I was making usually on the (laughs) training and like, so yeah. But it all pays off in the end if you're really dedicated. It does, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So Jennifer, I love the title of your book. And for those who don't know, it is Hear Me Roar, How to Defend Your Mind, Body, and Heart Against People Who Suck. Yeah. (laughs) I thought Mm. maybe we could dissect that into three sections because I have a lot of questions actually about (laughs) each one. I think it's really important to note that you start with the mind. And recently we did a podcast with a neuroscientist, Dr. Andrew Hill, on how to get the best performance out of your mind. But I'm really interested in hearing what it looks like to defend your mind. Mm, Interesting. Okay, great. Yeah, well, there's so many different ways, but on a very basic level, it's like protecting your mind against two things, I would say. One is your own little enemy is that little voice inside your head that tells you you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not skinny enough, you're not pretty enough, blah, blah, blah. All Mm -hmm. that garbage, right? And of course, that's a muscle that, just like, you know, a bicep that you have to train over and over and over again, basically to tell it to shut the hell up, tell it who's boss (laughs) and create a mantra that is the exact opposite of what that negative voice is saying. So if it's as simple as you're always late or you never have enough time, then your mantra might be, I always have enough time. Everything always gets done well. Something like that, something that's powerful and makes you feel good. And then against other people who suck, (laughs) it could be like (laughs) energy vampires, you know, people that weren't, weren't, weren't like the Debbie Downers in your life. Mm -hmm. Naysayers, cynics. Definitely. Yeah. Because obviously some Debbie Downers, maybe they just need help and need your help being lifted up. But the ones that really should just realize that they're blessed in life and they just want to complain anyway, you may (sighs) want to distance yourself from them. You may want to just create like an energetic shield. I don't have that in the book, but it's something I kind of do myself. Like it's almost like, like this like shield where like their energy is not going to come into my field and bring me down as hokey as that sounds. (laughs) It doesn't sound hokey at all. Actually. I'm a huge believer in that. I'm Mm -hmm. a huge believer in very selective consumption. So I'm not just selective about what kind of food I consume. I'm selective about what kind of media I consume, what kind of conversations I consume. I mean, we just had an election here yesterday and you can choose to expose yourself to a lot of negative media and a lot of kind of muckraking and stuff like that. Or you can choose to expose yourself to a lot of positive media and a lot of exciting things. And Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in selective consumption in that regard. So that's such a beautiful way to say it at the college workshops that I've been giving around the country recently, it's one of the biggest tips. I tell the girls, like, if you look at a magazine and you're all of a sudden comparing yourself to these fake photoshopped models and you now feel bad because you don't look like that, stop buying them. I gave up over a decade ago. I stopped buying magazines like that for that reason. I just don't need it in my life. I'd rather buy Entrepreneur Magazine or I always carry books around with me that are self-development or help me train myself, basically. Right. And I guess the natural progression of that, uh, coming back to the people who suck, is (laughs) the idea that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with and being extremely ruthless almost about who those five people are. Yeah, that's a really good point too. So yeah, defending, well, we I do get into dating and dating obviously and partners and all of that stuff in the book and not, 
you know, again, we talk about domestic violence and abuse and sexual assault, but even before you get there physically, you do have to protect yourself emotionally from those people that are closest to you. So those basically there's warning signs you can look for in people that you will date. And this goes for guys and women too. If they're just negative or putting you down or teasing you excessively, all these different signs, like that might not be the relationship for you. And I don't know how I just got on the relationship tangent, but sorry. (laughs) It's an interesting tangent. I actually read a study uh, when I was getting my bachelor's and there was a specialist who, of course, his name, uh, this was long before I was a memory and speed reading expert. I forgot Mm -hmm. his name, but within (laughs) two minutes, he basically sat down with a hundred couples for two minutes apiece and observed them telling the story of how they met. Mm -hmm. And 10 years later, he was able to predict with 98% accuracy whether or not they'd be together. And it came down to one thing and one thing only. When your partner tells a, I don't know how we got on this, but (laughs) when your partner tells a story, do you add to it? Is it yes and or no and? Right. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, we were both at the grocery store. No, no, no. We were at the farmer's market. (laughs) Right. Or is it yes we were, are you contributing or are you taking away value? I think that's really total tangent, but. That's okay. So when I was younger, I always really struggled with this kind of a self-esteem balance issue. Mm. And I went from a place of really, really low self-esteem as an adolescent. And I kind of completely overshot and overcompensated. So I think for a long period of time, I was kind of an arrogant little <laughs> before I learned how to find just the right amount of confidence. Is that something you see a lot with people you work with? Or how does someone prevent overshooting it when they're creating this mantra that says, I'm good enough and I'm great and I'm smart and I'm so on and so forth? You know, I work a lot in this field with the self confidence and health. I work a lot with women. So women don't tend to, in general, be. Mm-hmm super arrogant, especially if they're coming from a, a low self-esteem point. I see it more with men. And sorry, I know. You no, know, it's, it's fair. The, the research yeah. supports it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's just from personal experience. So I'm more in the business of trying to like lift women up, especially those that have been through like sexual assault or that kind of stuff. So yeah, I haven't experienced that much. And then when I was training in martial arts, mostly, I would say my clientele was more men than women. And these are like Wall Street guys when I was in New York and uh, super successful. And something about when you step in that dojang and training studio and you put on your uniform and you're meant to bow to each other and do all of, you know, that respect thing, all of the other stuff kind of melts away. So I also didn't find any arrogance in the male clients that I trained either. Mm -hmm. So maybe I was lucky. Maybe I attracted great client, great people, and maybe I don't tolerate arrogance. Maybe. That might be what it is. Mm -hmm. But that's actually a really good transition into defending our bodies. So as I mentioned, I also have actually a second degree black belt, but in the not as useful martial art of Taekwondo. Okay. So I really learned that, yeah, not all martial arts are created equally in terms of their street Mm -hmm. value, though. Mm Mm-hmm. So what are some of your more valuable tips that you give to people who might find themselves in a threatening situation? Sure. Well, I mean, that, again, that's a super broad question, but let me, can I start with just like, if you do want to, I get this question a lot. If I want to start training in martial arts, where do I begin? How do I pick a school? How do I pick a style even mm-hmm. since you kind of brought that up? And the one thing that I've observed after all these years is the most important thing is actually it starts from the top down. So the teacher or the master, the head of the school, whoever's running the school is more important than the actual style that you choose. That's my personal opinion, because I've seen these masters that are so arrogant or don't really care about their students or really just care about money and selling belts kind of and all that stuff versus the type of training that I came from where the master trains the head students to all these like compassionate and true leaders. Mm -hmm. So again, I went on a tangent, but that's where I would start if you were to want to train in martial arts. But as far as when I'm teaching my self-defense workshops, the first thing and most important thing that we always start with is awareness. So before you even can defend your body, you need to 
know where you are in space and time and what's around you, who's around you, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, making sure that your senses are unblocked. So you're not talking or texting on the phone while you're walking. Cause I know so many people do that. Right. No headphones on the street or in the subway. I see girls on the subways with their headphones on. I'm like, are you crazy? Yeah. All kinds of stuff like that. So awareness, start there. Definitely. I also, I had a very kind of brief opportunity for a short while to train with uh, one of the Gracie brothers. And what Mm -hmm. really was interesting to me is basically their approach and the way that they came in was in the context of this Taekwondo environment. Now, Taekwondo, for those who don't know, is all about kicks and punches. And essentially, in a perfect world, you stay on your feet, but it's never a perfect world. And what I loved about jujitsu specifically, which the Gracies teach was, you know what, there's a pretty good chance you're going to end up on your back. And that's where a lot of really, really ugly stuff can happen is if you get knocked down or your attacker pulls you down, you're in pretty big trouble if you don't know how to handle yourself and get back up and, you know, run away. Oh, yeah. Big time. And that's what I loved about you know, again, I don't know if it's a Hapkido thing or a my teacher thing, but we learned all different kinds of fighting styles. So yes, I'm trained in Hapkido specifically, but his training also included Japanese jujitsu, different ones as well, but those two main Hapkido and Japanese jujitsu. So we were doing locks and throws and floor stuff and boxing and everything combined. So it was a true, really mixed martial art. But so defending your body from attackers is really only one aspect of what you teach, if I'm not mistaken. What are the other components? Oh, defending your heart against Ah, attackers, right? Which I just touched on. I don't know over there right now, but here in the States, right? If you're reading the news here, which I'm sure you are, domestic violence, sexual assault on college campuses. I mean, it's huge. And those are not just random attacks on the street. Most sexual assault on college campuses is with someone that you know. So it's like a date rape or someone at a party that you've met before. So if you can defend your heart first and really love yourself, give yourself lots of self-worth, hopefully maybe you can leave those violent relationships or even before they get violent. So again, that's why in the book I have 20 signs you might be dating a creep. (laughs) And not to say that if your boyfriend checks off a couple of those boxes or girlfriend, I should say, that they're going to wind up beating you one day. It's just a sign that you could be in a verbally or emotionally abusive relationships. And sometimes that's worse or just as bad. Yeah, I think everyone's experienced that, unfortunately, to some extent when they're just with someone who doesn't give them the proper amount of respect. Yeah, absolutely. Or, you know, and it's hard to see it when you're in it. But, you know, I was in a very manipulative relationship. And now once you leave it, you can totally see like, oh, my God, what was I thinking? And now I know why my girlfriends and my sister were like, what are you doing with that guy? Right. Right? But when you're in it, you almost kind of get used to it or it. It's almost like you're addicted to it in certain situations. So Mm -hmm. those are the toughest to get out of sometimes. Well, and it reminds me of this saying that I've heard time and time again, which is you teach other people how to treat you. Yes, absolutely. It actually comes back a lot to the defending the mind Mm -hmm. in the sense that if you're treating yourself with respect and compassion, then other people feel compelled to do the same, it sounds like. Absolutely. And you're also drawing a line in the sand, like you won't permit that from other people. And that's what I had to do after that relationship, line in the sand. Absolutely. Then, you know, I will not date another guy that was like that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was taking responsibility. I don't like the blame game. Well, it's his fault, his fault. No, it was partly my responsibility for staying in that relationship. So I think that's a key component. Again, kind of controversial, I know a lot of women have kind of really got upset with me when I say things like that sometimes. But again, on a spiritual, energetic level, if you can't take responsibility for you and your past actions or your actions in general, how could you ever move forward? Right. And if you're not commanding respect, then why should other people feel compelled to give it to you? I mean, always we should treat Mm -hmm. people with respect. But if you're communicating that you feel you're of low self-worth, other people will subconsciously feel compelled to treat you as if you're of low self-worth. Right. And by no means is this blaming victims out there. I want to clarify that. Um, 
Never, never, never. It's more of a matter of kind of like you teach people how to treat you and inspiring yeah. people to treat themselves with love and compassion. Absolutely. Yes. And again, that's part of the book. First section is learning to love your body. So many of us girls are like hating our bodies and can't even take a compliment anymore. Another woman gives you a compliment. It's like, oh, no, no, no. You know, you can't even accept it. So learning to accept compliments, giving yourself or giving the universe or whatever higher power that you believe in, thanks and gratitude for the body that you have, for the strength that you have, for anything that you have is a really powerful step in self-healing and self-worth. So Jennifer, I feel like I have to take advantage of the fact that you're also first clinical nutritionist on the show. Mm. And, you know, you brought up loving your body. And I guess a big component of that is treating your body also with respect. Right. What sort of nutritional regimen do you support? Sure. I'll tell you, but with just the sidebar that it's not necessarily what I do. I don't necessarily think that everyone else has to do, but definitely I eat a whole foods diet, which yes, I do believe everyone should cut back (laughs) on processed foods. Fair. And really turn to a whole foods diet. Personally, I don't eat animal meat except for a little bit of wild fish here and there for the omega-3s and fatty acids. But as far as the meat produced in this country, yeah, with all the antibiotics and growth hormones and stuff, I gave that up 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. So part ethical, part there's uh, disgusting hormones in your meat decision. Yeah. And more than that, I mean, I have a gross story if you want to hear it. But <laughs> how gross. I mean, I'm paleo. So if you take away my mm. meat, I might starve. Okay. Well, I'll just tell you this one thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And again, I don't know the animal, the factory farming in Israel, so it could be better over there. And I have a feeling it is. But here I gave up meat maybe four years later. I'm in a nutrition workshop and the founder of the school is telling a story of a student of his who was married to a butcher. And she went into the butcher shop one day and said, why is that cow hanging from there? You know, what's that green slimy stuff on the cow? And he was like, oh, that's cancer. And we just cut it out and we serve the rest of the meat. And I was like, "Mm mm-hmm, because my dog died of cancer four years before. That's why I gave up meat because I was thinking if dogs can get cancer, so can all these other animals that we're eating. Wow. That was it for me. And it kind of solidified the fact that there's no, unless I'm buying meat from a farm where I know the farmer and I know how he's treating the animals and all that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. that I just rather not. So what's your take on synthetic meat? I know, uh, the founders of Google, I think it was, financed this like $5 million hamburger made of strictly cloned steak cells. Yeah, no way. No, no thanks. Way. No Not thanks. going anywhere near it? No way. Doesn't even sound <laughs> remotely appetizing or... Not yet, but if you can clone a perfect steak and no animal has to lose its life, that might be kind of interesting. But isn't that technically genetically modified as well? Definitely. <laughs> okay. So... No, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) A fair point. So I have to admit, I've done a lot of research on kind of male specific nutrition. I've personally restructured my own diet to support all the good stuff, increased testosterone, a lot more natural fats, upping selenium and magnesium, avoiding estrogenic foods, all that. But whenever women ask me, well, what should I eat? I'm always completely stumped. So what are some of the variances between the dietary needs of men and women besides the obvious kind of caloric requirements? Good question. Again, I think there's just so much more that goes into it on a personal level. So I don't like to say like, this is a diet for men. This is a diet for women. Because like I just explained for me, I mean, there's so many personal, emotional, cultural things that go into diet. And we're looking at it more these days, like it's a science experiment than it's actual food. Like it's food that's grown from the earth, that comes from animals. And I just feel like when we talk about it in terms of grams and this and that, it kind of loses what food at least means to me. And I know a lot of other people, which is nourishment and Mm -hmm. social bonding and all that kind of stuff. So I don't like to get too strict, but for women, a lot of women over the years, we've been told that fat is bad. So now there's still a lot of women are still scared to eat fat and we need good fat. So 
that's one thing I would definitely recommend to all women and men too. So again, not too different, but nuts and avocados and healthy oils like olive oil, coconut oil, throw that stuff in your smoothies, throw it on your salads, chia seeds. I put Brazil nuts every day in my smoothie for oh, thyroid yeah. health, Yeah, for the selenium. Exactly. Right. The Brazil nuts are also great for the gentleman. <laughs> yeah. They yeah, really, exactly. really support a healthy endocrine system. So. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, I think a lot of the healthy foods for, you know, go across the board for men and women. So did that sort of answer your question? Definitely. Now I'm curious if you're not getting a lot of animal protein, do you have a, a take on the kind of gluten, non-gluten? Are you trying to stick to paleo-esque foods or what's your take on all of that? Yeah, I read enough on gluten that I don't really, nobody needs it. Put it that way. <laughs> nobody yeah. needs gluten in their diet. If you cut out all wheat, you're better off. Or at least if you cut back on wheat, you're mm -hmm. definitely better off than if you have it. And that's not just if you have, you know, an intolerance or an allergy, but just I think everyone in general, because it's so genetically modified at this point, mm -hmm. I think about 50, 60 years ago, it all across the board. And what I was even more shocked to read was that it wasn't just the United States, but the wheat from all around the world has pretty much been genetically modified to this short strand and of wheat. And it's just much higher in gluten. Yeah. And there's just so much disease and inflammation going around that right. I think is one of the culprits. I'm reading actually a brilliant book right now called Sapiens. It's by mm -hmm. uh, Yuval Harari. Okay. And he's talking about why did these huge mammals all over the world, like mammoths and other kind of these huge marsupials, they all went extinct because they didn't have the 100,000 years to adapt to predators. You know, like, mm -hmm. you know, a smaller fish had 100, 200,000 years or more millions of years to adapt to the fact that sharks were becoming more clever and had better senses and became stronger. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about, you know, these animals went extinct because they couldn't adapt to our brain development over 70,000 years, right? We became clever enough to hunt large animals. Then if you consider that we've only been eating gluten and wheat for 10,000 years, it really puts things into perspective. Like that is not enough time for our bodies to adapt to something. And especially, like you said, 50 or 60 years since it's really become processed. Right. It's like, no wonder we're sick. and No wonder yeah. metabolic disease is a thing now. Yeah, absolutely. And just since you brought that up, and I know you're paleo, you know, <laughs> I totally understand, like, again, from a scientific standpoint, I understand the diet, what I think that people don't fully, and I'm not saying you, I know you do your research, but no, let me have it. Let me have it. <laughs> okay. My, you know, my personal opinion on paleo diet is what people just take it for what it is like, okay, well, I'll eat meat and I won't eat grains and da da da. But What's the quality of the meat that you're eating? If yep. you're not eating grass-fed beef and you're not eating organic free-range chickens, you are consuming so many chemicals and those animals don't eat their natural diet. So for example, right. chicken is now, you know, chickens and cows, they're fed soy and corn diets mostly mm -hmm. with some animal parts just thrown in. And the makeup of their meat is not the same that it was when animals were free range or, you know, were natural, of course. so naturally raised. So there's way more inflammatory fats than inflammatory fats in that animal that you're eating. So, you know, you're on the paleo diet and all of a sudden you're, you know, looking trim and you think from the outside, wow, this is really working. You're not thinking 20, 30 years down the line, what sure. about all the chemicals that I've just consumed, the growth hormones, the antibiotics, all of that stuff, cancer-causing chemicals, you know, that really needs to be thought about. Definitely. And I love when the butcher, you know, you ask him, recommend something for me and you're kind of thinking, I hope he has grass fed beef. And then he says, well, look at this beautiful marbleization. It's like, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, like <laughs> wild cows and so on and so forth right. did not have this marbleization. <laughs> right. That's not supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Just the fact that you're going to a butcher. I mean, people here are not getting their beef from butchers anymore. You know, we're getting right. it from grocery stores and factory farms mostly. So that's what really, I just want to please be careful people if you're doing that high meat kind of diet. Yeah. 
think long term. Definitely. Jennifer, who are some people whose work you really admire? Over the years, I have kind of delved into the self-development realm, if you will. And I am a huge, like, I love to, or, you know, I love to admit that I'm a huge Tony Robbins fan. <laughs> like, There's no shame in that. Oh, I love him so much. I did all his live workshops. So I went to Fiji and I went to San Francisco and Palm Springs and all these places. I did all his um, great, amazing, you know, training workshops. And I just think the guy's incredible physically, his energy. He can be on that stage like a rock star from 8 a.m. till 11 o'clock at night and like never stop. So I'm just in awe of him. Who else? I love Wayne Dyer from a spiritual perspective. I think he really can just break things down on such a level where we're all just one. You know, we're all kind of connected energetically. And I just, I love learning about that through him. Who else? And then in the nutrition field, I love Dr. Mark Hyman. Have you heard of him? I haven't. He's awesome. And I've seen him speak a lot. Um, again, at, at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, he would come every year and, and give a talk. Andrew, Dr. Andrew Weil, just people that really kind of know their stuff and aren't afraid. Now, Dr. Mark Hyman is getting into the Cleveland Clinic. So he's really trying to take this you know, holistic nutrition or alternative medicine into the mainstream. And I think that's really, really awesome and commendable. So can't wait to see what he does with that. Brilliant. I have to check out his stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's vegan paleo. Oh <laughs> Talk my about gosh. Strict. So basically he's eating like lettuce nuts. and I mean, you nuts can't eat, yeah, sweets. lettuce and nuts. You can't even eat legumes if you're strictly on paleo. Oh, oh boy. Wow, that's tough. <laughs> Look, I grew up in an Italian household. You better believe <laughs> that I'm going to have a slice of pizza once in a while, right. you know, or a bowl of pasta. So I just, I like the 90-10 rule or the 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you can stick to like your rules and your discipline 80 to 90% of the time, 10% of the time you can kind of indulge and yeah. I like my wine. So what are you going to do? You know, I love uh, Tim Ferriss and his kind of four hour body. He talks about the cheat day. And I think that's brilliant for two reasons. One, because like you said, it keeps you sane. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what's kept me for the last two years. But oh, two, yeah. and again, reading this book, Sapiens and talking about, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you were wandering in the jungle, it'd be pretty rare for you to find ripe fruit you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. not as abundant when you don't have a greenhouse to ripen it. And if you found a, a bushel of ripe bananas, you were going to gorge yourself and, <laughs> you know, like 700 grams of sugar because you can. <laughs> right. And uh, that's why our bodies have this amazing ability to pump out insulin when we need it. So right. the cheat day is a good thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, Tim Ferriss didn't make that up. Like that's been around for a while. <laughs> Exactly. Just the idea that I love is like, you're going to cheat. Yeah. At least do it structured. Oh, hell yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so Jennifer, what's next? What are you working on now? Okay. What am I working on now? Lots of stuff, but I am taking this Hear Me Roar presentation and trying to visit as many schools as possible that are interested. So I've just got back from Cornell University where I talked Monday night. That was my first Ivy League school. So I was really excited. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Heading to UC Boulder and Arizona State. And I've had a few others. So that's one big part of what I love to do. I love to be out there. I love to be meeting people. I love to be connecting with people. Online is great too. So I'd like to develop a few online training programs. And what else? I have another book idea in mind, but I want to really give this hear me roar baby some more attention and nurturing before I move on to that. <laughs> awesome. Did you self-publish hear me roar? Yes, we self-published. I co-authored it with a friend named Lindsay Smith and she had already self-published a few books. So she knew how to do that and it was all good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm hoping to actually self-publish my book in mm. two to three weeks from now. So excellent. Yeah. Can't I finally wait to convinced see it. myself that like major, major authors, the Tim Ferriss's and the James Altucher's of the world are self-publishing. So wow. it's really the way to go today. It seems like. Well, you know what it is? The best part is you don't have to wait a year to publish something that you have written. Right. Like it's usually takes like about a year even, and you have to find a publisher and an agent and blah, blah, blah. I mean, and the publishing place has changed so much that, yeah. you know, I, I think self-publishing is really cool. 
Yeah. And if you crush it, then, you know, the ideal situation is to have them come to you. Right. Exactly. So very cool. Jennifer, I don't want to take too much of your time, but if people want to reach out, if they want to learn more, check out your book or DVDs, where should we direct them in the show notes? Okay. You can go to jennifercassetta.com. There's a blog with lots of recipes that I post, videos that I post. And then on the shop button, you have everything. So you can get the Stilettos and Self DVD. But then there's also a couple other DVDs that I did that are pretty much unisex if you want to go a little deeper into some self-defense training. So they're on there as well. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm all over social media at Jen Cassetta, so pretty easy to find. Cool. We will put that in the show notes, and if someone doesn't check it, it's two S's and two T's. Yes, two N's, two S's, two T's. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. You keep it easy for us. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. It was such a pleasure having you. Awesome. I really appreciate being here, and thank you all for listening. Thanks so much, Jennifer, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye now. So that's it for this week's episode. I hope you guys thoroughly enjoyed it. If so, please take a moment to leave a review on iTunes and to share it with your friends and family. You know, another thing is that we're always looking for guest posts and guests on the blog and on the podcast. So if you know somebody or are somebody who has an interesting superhuman skill to share either on the blog or the podcast, please be in touch with us. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.